Welcome to Brainish English Stories. I'm going to write a story that's strange but familiar. I don't ask you to believe it because it's so unbelievable. I'm not crazy, but I'm going to die soon, so I want to share my story. I want to tell you about some everyday events that scared, tortured, and destroyed me. I won't explain them, though. They were horrifying to me, but maybe to you they'll seem less scary. Maybe someday someone smarter than me will explain these events as simple and ordinary. I was always known for being gentle and kind since I was a little child. My kindness was so obvious that my friends often teased me. I loved animals, and my parents let me have many pets. I spent most of my time with them, and nothing made me happier than feeding and playing with them. As I grew up, this love for animals remained one of my greatest joys. If you've ever loved a loyal and smart dog, you'll understand the happiness it brings. There's something special about the selfless love of animals that touches the heart, especially when you've experienced the shallow friendship of humans. I got married young, and luckily, my wife shared my love for pets. She did her best to bring home all kinds of cute animals. We had birds, goldfish, a lovely dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. Our cat was remarkable. It was big, all black, and incredibly clever. My wife sometimes joked about the old belief that black cats were witches in disguise. She didn't really believe it, but it's worth mentioning because it's relevant to the story. I named the cat Pluto, and he became my best friend. I took care of him, and he followed me everywhere in our house. I couldn't even stop him from following me outside. Our friendship lasted for many years, but during that time, something terrible happened to me. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I changed for the worse because of drinking too much alcohol. I became moody, irritable, and didn't care about others' feelings. I even spoke rudely to my wife and, at times, hurt her physically. Sadly, my pets suffered because of my behavior. I neglected and mistreated them. Pluto was the only one I didn't harm, even though I mistreated the rabbits, the monkey, and even the dog if they got in my way. My sickness got worse over time, and even Pluto, who was getting old and a bit grumpy, started feeling the effects of my bad temper. One night, I came home very drunk from one of my hangouts in town. I thought the cat was avoiding me, and in my anger, I grabbed him. He got scared and bit my hand slightly. I turned into a monster instantly. I didn't recognize myself. It was like my good side disappeared, and I felt an evil anger that came from drinking too much. I took out a small knife from my pocket, opened it, grabbed the poor cat by the throat, and cut out one of its eyes. I'm filled with shame, burning with guilt, and trembling as I write about this terrible thing I did. When I woke up the next morning and my mind cleared from the alcohol, I felt a mix of horror and regret for what I had done. But it was a weak feeling, and my soul remained cold. I went back to my excessive drinking and tried to forget about the horrible act. Meanwhile, the cat slowly got better. It looked scary with the missing eye, but it didn't seem to be in pain. However, 
It was terrified of me and ran away whenever I came near. At first, I was sad because a creature that used to love me now hated me. But soon, I got irritated. And then, something even worse happened. It was the spirit of stubbornness. People don't talk about it much, but it's a part of human nature. Have you ever done something wrong just because you knew you shouldn't? Sometimes, we want to break the rules just for the sake of it. This stubbornness led me to harm the innocent cat even more. One morning, I put a noose around its neck and hanged it from a tree branch. I did it with tears in my eyes and the heaviest regret in my heart. I did it even though I knew the cat had loved me and had never given me any reason to hurt it. I did it knowing it was a terrible sin, one that could make my soul unforgivable even by the most merciful God. On the night after I hanged the cat, I was woken up by a fire. My bed curtains were on fire, and the whole house was burning. It was hard, but my wife, a servant, and I managed to escape from the fire. Everything I owned was gone, and I gave in to despair. I can't prove there's a connection between the fire and what I did to the cat, but I want to tell you all the facts. The day after the fire, I went to see what was left of our home. Almost all the walls had fallen, except for one. This wall was in the middle of the house, and my bed had been against it. The plaster on this wall mostly survived the fire because it had been recently applied. Many people were gathered around this wall, examining it closely and saying things like strange and weird. This caught my attention, so I went closer and saw, like it was carved into the white surface, a big picture of the cat. It had a rope around its neck. When I first saw this strange sight, I was both amazed and scared. But after thinking for a while, I figured out what might have happened. You see, the cat had been hung in a garden near our house. When the fire alarm rang, people rushed into the garden, and one of them probably cut the cat from the tree and threw it into my room through an open window. The falling walls pressed the cat into the fresh plaster, and the lime, flames, and ammonia from the cat's body created the picture I saw. Even though I could explain this to myself, the image of the cat stayed with me for months. During that time, I felt something like guilt, although not very strong. I even started to regret losing the cat and looked for another one like it to replace it. One night, while I was in a very bad place, I noticed something black on top of one of the big barrels of gin or rum in the room. I had been staring at the barrel for a while, so I was surprised I hadn't seen it earlier. I went closer and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, just as big as Pluto, and it looked exactly like him, except for one thing. Pluto had no white on him, but this cat had a big white spot on its chest. When I touched it, the cat immediately woke up, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and seemed happy that I noticed it. This was the cat I had been looking for. I offered to buy it from the owner of the place, but he didn't know anything about the cat and said it didn't belong to him. I petted the cat and when I was about to leave, it wanted to come with me. I allowed it to do so, and on reaching home, it settled in right away and became my wife's favorite. Strangely, I started to dislike the cat. 
This was the opposite of what I had expected. I'm not sure why, but its affection for me began to disgust and annoy me. Over time, this disgust turned into hatred. I avoided the cat, unable to physically harm it due to the guilt I felt from my previous cruelty. For weeks, I didn't hurt it, but slowly, I started to look at it with absolute disgust and ran away from it as if it carried a deadly disease. What made me hate the cat even more was the discovery, the morning after I brought it home, that like Pluto, it had only one eye. However, my wife felt sympathy for it and saw it as a sign of our cat's suffering and vulnerability, which only made her like the new cat more. But the new cat's affection for me grew stronger. It followed me everywhere, and it's hard to explain how persistent it was. When I sat down, it would sit under my chair or jump on my lap, smothering me with its disgusting love. If I stood up, it would get between my feet and almost make me fall, or it would use its sharp claws to climb up my clothes and reach my chest. At these times, even though I wanted to hurt it, I couldn't because I remembered my previous crime, and I was also afraid of the cat. This fear wasn't exactly fear of physical harm, but it's hard to describe. I'm almost ashamed to admit it, even in this prison cell, but this terror and horror that the cat gave me were made worse by something incredibly irrational. My wife had pointed out the white mark on the cat, which was the only visible difference between it and the cat I had killed. At first, this mark was not clear, but over time, it became more distinct. Now, it looked like a horrifying and ghastly image. It was an image of the gallows, that terrible instrument of horror, crime, agony, and death. At this point, I was truly miserable, suffering more than any human should, and it was a creature whose kind I had cruelly taken for granted that was now causing me unimaginable pain. A beast was making me, a man created in God's image, endure such unbearable suffering. Sadly, I no longer knew the comfort of rest, day or night. During the day, the cat never left me alone, and at night, I woke up from horrifying dreams only to find the cat's hot breath on my face and its heavy weight, like a never-ending nightmare, on my chest. Under these tortures, the last bit of good within me gave in. Evil thoughts became my only companions, dark and evil thoughts. My usual grumpiness turned into hatred for everything and everyone, and my anger burst out uncontrollably. Sadly, my poor wife was the one who suffered the most from my sudden, frequent, and violent fits of rage. One day, she accompanied me into the cellar of our old, run-down house on some household errand. The cat followed us down the steep stairs and nearly tripped me, making me incredibly angry. I picked up an axe and, overcome by anger and forgetting the childish fear that had stopped me before, I swung it at the cat. If it had landed as I intended, it would have killed the cat instantly. However, my wife's hand stopped the blow. Her interference made me even more furious, and I pulled my arm from her grasp and struck her in the head with the axe. She fell dead on the spot without a sound. That horrible cat made me kill my wife. I didn't want to kill my wife. That cat was the killer of my wife. With this terrible murder done, I calmly and deliberately set about hiding the body. 
I knew I couldn't take it out of the house without being seen by the neighbors, so I considered various plans. At one point, I thought about chopping the body into tiny pieces and burning them. Another time, I thought about digging a grave for her in the cellar floor. Then, I thought about throwing her in the yard well or packing her in a box like merchandise and hiring a porter to carry her out. Finally, I came up with what I thought was a better plan. I decided to wall her up in the cellar, just like the medieval monks were said to have done with their victims. The cellar was perfect for this plan. Its walls were not solid, and they had been recently covered with a rough plaster that hadn't fully hardened due to the dampness. Plus, there was a projection in one of the walls, where a false chimney or fireplace had been filled in to match the rest of the cellar. I was confident I could easily remove the bricks at that spot, put the body there, and then rebuild the wall so that it wouldn't look suspicious. And I was right. Using a crowbar, I removed the bricks without much trouble and carefully placed the body against the inner wall. I propped it up, relayed the bricks exactly as they were, and used mortar, sand, and hair to create a plaster that matched the old one. When I finished, I couldn't tell that anything had been disturbed. I cleaned up all the debris on the floor meticulously. I looked around, feeling triumphant, and said to myself, at least here, my efforts have not been in vain. The next thing I needed to do was find the creature that had caused so much misery, as I had finally decided to end its life. If I had found it then, there's no doubt it would have met its end. But it seemed the cunning cat had sensed my violent temper and decided to keep a safe distance. It's impossible to describe or even imagine the immense relief I felt with the absence of that detested creature. It didn't show up that night, and for at least one night since it had entered our house, I slept soundly and peacefully, even with the weight of murder on my soul. The second and third days passed, and still, my tormentor did not appear. Once again, I breathed freely. The monster had fled in terror and was gone forever. I thought I would never see it again. I felt incredibly happy and the guilt of my dark deed bothered me very little. There were a few questions asked, but I answered them easily. They even conducted a search, but, of course, found nothing. I believed my future happiness was secure. On the fourth day after the murder, a group of police officers unexpectedly entered the house and began a thorough search of the premises. However, I felt no fear, secure in the hidden place where I had concealed the body. The officers asked me to join them in their search, and they left no corner unexamined. Finally, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I didn't show any signs of nervousness. My heart beat calmly, like that of someone who sleeps innocently. I walked around the cellar without a worry, my arms folded across my chest. The police officers seemed satisfied and ready to leave. I was so overjoyed that I couldn't contain myself. I desperately wanted to say something to confirm my innocence. Gentlemen, I said as the group started to go up the stairs, I'm delighted to have cleared your suspicions. I wish you all good health and a bit more politeness. By the way, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house. 
In my desperate need to say something, I hardly knew what I was saying at all. I may even say it's an excellently well constructed house. These walls are you leaving, gentlemen, these walls are solidly put together. And here, driven by a senseless urge to boast, I struck heavily with a cane I had in my hand against the exact spot in the brickwork behind which lay my wife's lifeless body. But may God protect me from the evil cat. No sooner had the echoes of my blows faded into silence than I was met with a voice from inside the tomb. A cry, at first faint and broken, like a child sobbing, but quickly growing into one long, loud, and continuous scream. It was a scream that was utterly unnatural and inhuman, a mixture of horror and triumph, a howl, a wailing shriek that could only have come from hell itself. I cannot describe my own thoughts. I fainted and staggered to the opposite wall. For a moment, the group on the stairs remained frozen in terror and awe. Then, in an instant, a dozen strong arms began tearing down the wall. It collapsed completely. The corpse, already greatly decomposed and covered in blood, stood upright before the stunned witnesses. On its head, with a mouth wide open and a single fiery eye, sat the hideous cat that had lured me into murder and whose voice had condemned me to the gallows. I had walled the monster up in the tomb.